Constructing your life is about much more than just building a bank account. Each week, join real estate entrepreneur and mindset coach Austin Linney as he interviews guests who are constructing their dream lives and impacting the world around them on a daily basis. If you're an entrepreneur or wanting to start a business, or you just want to hear motivating stories of how others have overcome the odds, you are in the right place. And now for your host, Austin Linney. Guys, welcome back to Construct Your Life. This is Austin Lay here with your, uh, we got a new guest today. Uh, I don't think I've ever had an Olympian on the podcast. So, uh, you know, 500 episodes, this is the first time we have uh, Lauren Wilkinson here. How are you doing today? I'm good, thanks. I'm good. We were talking about kids and, and all that kind of stuff. I'm sure we'll get into some of that stuff. But what I like to do with my guests is kind of let them tell their story and, and we can kind of start from there and, and we can go from there. All right. Uh, well, yeah, my name is Laura Wilkinson. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Um, I kind of grew up as a gymnast and wanted to be Mary Lou Retton, but realized I wasn't very good. And so I still had this dream of wanting to go to the Olympics though. So for a couple of years, I tried all different sports and it, you know, it took me a while, but I finally found my way to the pool and tried this thing called diving, which was like gymnastics into the water. Right. And I mm -hmm. loved it. Fell in love. First day I stepped on the pool deck. Um, I knew that was going to be for me. And, you know, it had a, a lot of ups and downs along the way, but, um, managed to make it to three Olympic games, um, won the Olympics, won the world championships, won the world cup, did lots of cool things. Um, retired, have four kids to, to birth, to be, to be adoption. And, um, then I decided to get back in the water and play a little more, went to the 2021, um, Olympic trials and ended up finaling at the age of 43 with all my kids there to watch, which was pretty cool. And, um, now I'm kind of coaching more of the mindset and the mental game for athletes. And I'm, I'm loving that. It's like the first thing I've been, you know, really excited to do outside of the pool. <laughs> No, I love that. So much great accomplishments. I think what's interesting to me in, in kind of the way I can relate it to business is, you know, there's so much training that goes in with the Olympics for an event that lasts, you know, a day or two days or, or a couple seconds, right? Or the, the, the act of the event. You know, I think the thing I'm most curious about is, is how do you win those days that you don't want to? when that, that event is four years away, right? It's not, it's not every day. How do you, what, what are you saying to yourself mentally or, or, or what, what conversations are you having in your head to keep yourself going? Uh, well, I it's think exhausting. There, yeah. yeah, no, I mean, that's a great question. And I think there's a, a couple, a couple things to that. I think um, I'm a huge goal setter. I love to set goals and I love to teach people how to set goals. Um, and I really hate the term realistic goals. Cause I think that's just it, it it's an oxymoron. You know what I mean? You mm -hmm. can't have a realistic goal. Like if it's realistic and it's something you can do, it should be on your to-do list and you should do it and check it off, you know, but mm -hmm. a goal is supposed to be something that you can't currently do. It's supposed to be something out of your reach that you have to grow and change and step out of your comfort zone in order to do. And so when you have a goal like that, that is two years or four years away, um, you know, it can be really hard to lose motivation. So setting like smaller goals in between that I think kind of like stepping stone goals, I think is really important because it helps you keep on track toward that long-term target um, without kind of veering way off course. Um, but it gives you something else to shoot for in the meantime and, and stay motivated. But then also you have to have a reason why you're doing it because there are going to be days, the most motivated person in the world. And I am a highly motivated person. There are days where I'm like, I'm tired. I'm sore. I'm cold. I do not want to do this. But then I remember why I'm doing it. And that's what gets me up. That's what, you know, keeps me going and um, makes me work hard on those tough days. So definitely like the interim goals, the stepping stone goals and having that why that big motivation um, is going to keep you going. And, and why were you doing it? Well, it, you know, it would go back and forth over time. And sometimes it wasn't just one reason. Like I was just at the beginning, just very highly motivated. Like my dream is to stand on top of that podium. I want to win a gold medal. I want to be this person. And it wasn't so much that I wanted fame and, and all these, you know, whatever things that, I mean, that doesn't really happen in my sport anyway, but like, that wasn't, that wasn't the goal. And I've met a lot of Olympians that are very upset after they do something amazing because they mm -hmm. thought they would get more out of it. My goal was just like, I want to be the best. I want to be the best in the world. And I want to stay on top of that podium because I earned it. And I want everybody to do really well. And I still want to be the best. Like that was always mm -hmm. my goal. And that kept me going because I knew 
if I don't get up and do something, I know somebody over in China is getting up and doing it right now. Somebody over in Russia is getting up and working hard real, right now. So I need to get up and make sure I'm working twice as hard and make sure I'm focusing on the right things. I'm taking care of myself. And so that was always a big motivation this time kind of coming back. And, and even as I was going into like my second and third Olympic games, it changed a little bit. Like, cause I had already won the Olympics. I had already won the world championships. So it's like, well, why do you keep going? Like, why do you want to do it? But I had personal goals of like, I wanted to know how good I could be. Like it was, a, it was kind of a sense of just internal pride of like, nobody even has to see this or recognize it. I want to know how hard of dives can I do to the very best of my ability? Like, I just wanted to push that boundary and I wanted to do things that other women weren't doing and, you know, just really kind of break any ceiling that was there. Like, I just wanted to find out um, how good I could be. You know, that was like a very just personal thing that I had through, through 08. And this time coming back, like a, a lot of it was, I want my kids to, to see what it takes to work for something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that you really want. Cause it's, it's not easy. It's not like you just set the goal, you do a couple of things and it's there. I mean, you can do a and B and C and, and not get to that goal. Like you can still fail. So mm -hmm. this is what it takes. It takes doing all those things plus extra. And, and especially like when the pandemic hit and the Olympics were postponed for a year, it was actually, it was really frustrating and really cool all at the same time because I was stuck at home and I'm trying to do flips in my backyard with these mats that I was able to take with me and in the garage and, and the kids were trying to like just get in the mats while I'm flipping and it was just such a crazy and I was so frustrated because I'm used to having my own time and this being, you know, my space and they're invading it and I was so <laughs> frustrated but then I realized, okay, well, I have time, like the Olympics aren't tomorrow. So I need to let them be part of this process. And mm -hmm. so they would watch me and my littlest one would like try and coach me. And then they would get their turn on it, you know, and they could play with mommy and be part of what I was doing. And they started cheering me on, you know, and it was really cool days where I'm like trying to do our little, you know, through zoom, we were doing like team workouts and stuff. And I'm trying to do these hit workouts up in the game room. And, you know, I'm, I'm red faced and sweating and shaking. And my little six-year-old is like next to me going, you got it, mommy. And she's like planking right there next to me, you know, and, and it was just, it was, it was awesome. And so that was a bit different twist to it, but, but even more special. Oh, so, oh that's the best man that I was thinking about that. Uh, one of my uh, business partner's husband is an ex former baseball player. You know, he, he tells stories about, you know, uh, the kids getting to see him for the first time and, you know, how it was so great. And he was so driven, you know, when he, uh, when he went out on his own, but when he started having kids, you know, it's like, you know, when they're in the stands, it's like so much better that they get to see dad. And mm -hmm. you know, now they're both baseball players. And, and, you know, it's just amazing yeah. to see that uh, kind of come full circle. Now, I think where we could spend the next, the entire podcast, this is the question that I'm sure everybody asks you, you know, your identity for so long is wrapped up in an Olympian, a trainer, uh, when those days are done, uh, you know, uh, how do you reshift your identity? Was that a, was that a big gap for you? Did you, were you already doing some coaching, you know, kind of at the end or, or was it, did you kind of like take a, a brief pause and kind of reassociate the identity to what you're doing now? Yeah, no, great question. It is really hard. Um, and, and as an athlete, you, you know, you get really wrapped up in your value and your worth as a person being wrapped up in like your score or your placement or your performance. And, and that's tough too. And, and I had done pretty good at trying to separate myself and my, my self-worth from my performance, but that's, that's always an ongoing battle. Um, you know, and, and even, being outside the pool and doing different stuff. Now I, I have to make sure I'm separating myself from what I'm doing. Like, this is what I do. It's not who I am as a person. So I think in, in whatever we're doing, it's easy to get wrapped up in those things we do and take them very personally. Um, but when I, when I first retired in, in 2008, it was really hard because the only thing I wanted to do was be a mom. The only thing outside the pool I wanted to do is be a mom and we couldn't get pregnant. And my husband didn't want to adopt at the beginning. And it was a really difficult time because I was like, if I'm not a diver and I'm not a mom, like who am I and who I'm, who am I supposed to be? And so that was a really kind of dark couple of years as I was trying to figure that out. And, um, really it, it kind of brought me to my knees and deepened my relationship with God, having to realize that he was enough for me, whether I could have the things I wanted or not, like he needed to be enough for me. And it really just, it, it changed my outlook on everything. It changed my purpose and everything. And, you know, my husband's mind was totally changed on adoption. We decided to start doing the adoption route. And then within that journey, we got pregnant in the process. And um, after we brought our 
second daughter home from China, we decided to adopt again from Ethiopia this time. And then three days later, found out I was pregnant again. So we ended up having, you know, we have four kids within four and a half years. So they're all really oh, close together goodness. and it's crazy and wild, but it's, it's better than I ever could have planned it out or dreamed of. Um, so to just kind of see that kind of come full circle has been really, really cool too. No, it's so true. I mean, the moment that you let it go is the moment that it comes to, yeah. you know, and I Often, think, yeah. uh, you know, uh, one of my coaches was a, you know, pretty successful kickboxer and he broke his leg and, you know, he talks about, you know, how he was just for two, three years, just trying to figure out what it meant, you know, to be himself, right. When you mm -hmm. associate, and I, th I, I see a lot of people do that with, um, jobs and they do that with everything that they do. Right. And mm -hmm. it's really hard. Um, and I think what we don't do uh, and I respect you for doing, I don't think we take the time to really, you know, take a break. Right. I think you need an anchor point in your life to kind of separate, you know, anytime somebody's like leaving their W2 and they're moving into entrepreneurship, I'm like, you need to take off like 30 days and really sit with yourself and, and, and create that kind of separation. Right. Cause I feel like most times, especially with kids, life is just a blur yeah. uh, a lot of times and you, and you, and, and you wake up six months later and you don't even know how you got there. Yeah, <laughs> very true. Yeah. Very true. yeah. And so when you started, when you started coaching, you know, me, I have an obsession with uh, helping people and, and coaching and, and, and it's just my thing. I mean, it seems like it's an easy transition from, from sports and, and Olympians to coaching, you know, how did that journey for you start? And, and is this something that you were always passionate about? Um, well, I mean, I, I actually got really good at the mental side of things because of an injury, um, before 2000, about three months before the Olympic trials, I shattered my foot in three places and, uh, surgery would have put me out of trials. And so we casted my foot the way that it was, I had a bone lodged underneath, I, um, lodged underneath my foot. And that's the way we, we casted it, hoping that it would heal well enough to walk on, you know, maybe jump off of, um, so I spent like 10 weeks in this cast and not able to get in the water, not able to do much of anything, but my coach would hold my crutches and I would hop all the way up to the 10 meter and go out to the edge. And I would, I would go through the actions of my dives and I would go through it in my mind. And I got really good at visualizing and involving all of my senses. I mean, I was doing this for hours and hours a day because I had nothing else to do. And, um, I really fully immersed myself in it and would put myself in all kinds of competition scenarios and all kinds of different equations. And there was a lot of ups and downs throughout that, but it changed very much who I was and, and the type of athlete and competitor I was. And I was able with just two and a half weeks back in the water before Olympic trials to not just get my dives back off the platform, which two and a half weeks is like zero time to get your dives back off of a 10 meter platform. But I ended up winning the trials by 40 points. And I knew something was different. And going into the Olympic games that year, like I had always had a good shot at making the Olympic team. I was one of our better divers. Like that wasn't a super big surprise, but I don't think I would have been able to stand on top of the podium without having gone through that process and becoming such a mentally strong athlete. And I realized how that impacted me and it changed me moving forward. And I went through several other situations um, where I had to employ those kind of um, different mental techniques as well. And I got better and better at it and, um, you know, had a lot of failures in the process, but learned a lot from that. And so I really grew in that way. And I was doing stuff that nobody else was doing in our sport. Yeah. And um, when I came back to it, um, being older, having kids, I had to go through a neck surgery, which took me out for like, I was out of the water completely for almost six months and then a year off the platform. Um, and then we had a pandemic, like it was all kinds of crazy. It was a crazy road. So just being able to get back and do what I did involved a lot of that as well. And so I, I feel like it's just kind of been this evolution and, you know, trying to learn how to put it together to teach others. When I was actually sidelined with my neck surgery, I was, I was just trying to write down all the things that I had learned. So I'm like, I have this time, I need to use it and try to get my mind right if I'll even be able to come back. And so I started looking at all these different stories and all these different things I was remembering that I had learned. And I started putting them to these little buckets of like goal setting and finding your why and fear and failure and visualization and self-talk and all these different things. And I, I ended up making a course out of it and it was great. And I took some athlete, a very small group of athletes through it and they loved it. It was very impactful, but then I got back in the water and I kind of like shelved it. Didn't really think about it again. And, you know, when the pandemic hit, I kind of ran a, a little fear challenge thing to try. Cause I knew fear was a big deal. Like everybody was freaking out. And I had like 300 people go through this thing and just 
the feedback I got from it was amazing. It was this simple little five day challenge and people were completely looking at their lives differently. It was really cool. And so I think those little things like were showing me that like, okay, this, this isn't just stupid things that I'm doing for myself that are helpful to me. Like this is actually helping people. Mm -hmm. And so now that I've kind of stepped away from the pool a little bit, I'm trying to put that into play and coaching people one-on-one, -on -one, bringing back the course and these challenges. And, and so it's, it's really cool. And I'm trying to, and, it, and it's funny because being an entrepreneur and, and learning how to do this, it's like starting all over again. And it's hard when you have been at the top of your craft for such a long time to start at zero and try to have this authority and this confidence to teach people and to, to promote it. So I'm, I'm totally on this upward learning curve right now, but, but I love the challenge of it. And I, I keep reminding myself that I have taught so many people and I'm getting such good feedback that even though it's maybe a small group of people, like it's real, you know, and I can take these tools and teach others. And so it's kind of, again, this daily reminder of, I am not my course. I'm not what I'm teaching, but I, I can be confident in what I'm doing and, and help people with that. So it's uh yeah, it's, it, it was kind of a, a long progression, but, but that's kind of how it came to be. I find uh, mindset coaching, what I do in, in, in business consulting, I find it to be the most um, unprotected view of oneself, meaning like there is no place to hide, you know, and I, and I tell the same story all the time. The first coaching call I ever got on, we were two minutes in and the guy goes, I want to leave my wife. And I like, I mean, I literally like go, okay, so this isn't like, we're not just having fun here. There's like kids involved. And, you know, I kind of like kept it together for like 45 minutes. I listened, I listened, and then I hit him with, uh, you know, a saying, and he just kind of sat back in his chair and he was like, that was good. And they're still together to this day. And that was, you know, five years ago. And it was the moment that I started taking it seriously. Right. But, but, but understanding that each each person needs a little something different, right? And, and some days you need to be, you know, uh, the guy from any given Sunday, you know, Al Pacino in that speech. And then some days you need kitten gloves. And uh, it, it's really fun, right? Because it doesn't matter what success you had, like you said, as an Olympian, you're, you have to show up every day for your clients. And so I always tell myself, like, all you have to do is focus on the clients that's in front of you. And then that's the only thing that matters. If you do right by them, mm -hmm. then the rest is gonna, gonna go. Um, when you started taking on clients are you taking on other athletes or business people does it cover the gamut uh you know for, for people that you're coaching right now it's mostly athletes um but okay. it's been a range i mean there's definitely been some junior athletes some college age athletes some i've got a couple of pro athletes um and uh some masters athletes too so mm -hmm. it's it's quite the spectrum and it's it's really cool to kind of figure out when people come to you like where they're at and you know, and it's, it's funny because I get these, some of these littler kids that are like 13 that, that I have to like pull stuff out of. And it's really hard to some. So I feel like those conversations are shorter, but they're also the ones who immediately implement and see yep. changes. And I get these notes from their mom of like, you won't believe what she did with one practice after she talked to mm -hmm. you. Like, you know, and mm -hmm. so it's kind of cool because sometimes you're like, I have no idea how that went. Like, I think it went okay, but I didn't get a lot of feedback, you know, and then you get a note like that, which is cool. And then, then other people who like kind of like your client are so open and, and willing to, to just be so vulnerable and, and talk with you through these things. It's really cool. Uh, but to just, it, it's, it's so hard for me, like being somebody who is always in an individual sport, you know, not really a team thing so much, but I'm always the one doing it. So to teach someone and having to like trust them to like implement it is a really, that's a new thing for me. And I'm, I'm having it like, it's just such a weird, like not having that kind of control. Like I have to like, let them do it. And I, like what my coach has always told me is like ringing true. Cause he's always like, Laura, I can teach you everything that I know. I can tell you all the things I can give you examples. I can hold your hand as you walk all the way to the 10 meter. But at some point, like you have to go to the end and you're the one who has to jump. I can't do that part for you. And so that's what I try to remember when I'm like, okay, I'm giving these people all these tools. I hope they can jump. Like, I yeah. hope they can take that leap and, and trust me and, and try these things, you know? And so, uh, yeah, that, that has definitely been a different comfort zone for me. <laughs> so I want to tell you a story that I think will really resonate with you that kind of set me, it changed my coaching for, for the rest of my life. Um, I had a client, uh, this is my biggest client ever. This was a couple of years ago. I mean, it, when I say biggest, like by like miles, a lot of money, big deal, building out a company from a very hard guy older guy, very high level business, you know, just, I mean, he was a tough cookie. Like you would put your hand in the lion's den a lot of times, but 
had some childhood stuff. We, we got through a lot of good stuff. We were doing some good work uh, for three or four months. And uh, then he just ghosted me and didn't, you know, he still owed me a, a bunch of money. Right. And I was, it really messed me up for a while, uh, but it just so happened that uh, I had a friend who was working with him on a different part of his business. And I got a message at like 5 a.m. one morning and he says, Hey, uh, I was, re- I was listening to his podcast. And this was like, this was like eight months later. I was listening to his podcast and I, I really think you should listen to this, this, this one minute clip. And I was like, I don't really want to, like, I, I'm not a fan of this guy. And in the clip, he said that I might have not handled it the perfect way, but there was this young kid who was super direct with me and told me exactly what I needed my life to be. And I fought him every way, but for the rest of my life, I'll truly thank him for the work that he did on me. Cause I'm a better person. And at the end of the message, my buddy said, if your true goal in life was to impact others, no matter what, then does it matter mm. when it happened? And I was like, ah, oh, okay. <laughs> That's you know, because you, you and I are very similar. We're a driven people go, go, go fast, 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 do better, do better, raise your goals. And so sometimes it doesn't sit with people the same way that it does us. Mm-hmm. And, and I've had to throttle back and, and say like, okay, well, they're listening when it soaks in, you know, it took me 36 years to get, you know, 20 years to get sober. Like wow. it, it doesn't happen, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. And so, uh, that's been my biggest thing because, you know, I want my clients to do better and I want all this. And it's like, you know, that lesson might not sink in for a couple months after the coaching, you know? And so that's yeah. been my biggest evolution as a coach. That's cool. Well, that's, that's good to hear, you know, so I, yeah. <laughs> I you know as I'm getting my feet wet in there, I appreciate 100%. that. percent. And, and I think, I think one of the lessons that was the greatest lesson ever, I studied some NLP uh, and which is neuro-linguistic programming, which is a type of coaching that Tony Robbins does. And I was watching the video and he said, look, if you, if you as a coach, I swear to God, I turned off the video after this. I didn't even do any of the rest of the course. He said, if you have the coach believe that your client will change, like you truly believe it in your core, 90% of the time they will change. And I go, oh, I'm good. So I just have to believe that they'll change and the energy will make them rise up to it. And that's really kind of the, the tools I've taken in my coaching. When, when people come to you, an athlete, which is a high, a high tense, you know, they're focused, they're driven, right? They're driven. That's not the problem. They're, they're at the peak. What are you seeing that's kind of holding them back? Is it, is it limiting beliefs? Is it, is it fear of failure? Like what are the, the, the overall steps that you see? It's honestly the same stuff that you go through when you're little. It's just presenting in different ways. You know, like they, they still feel pressure, whether they're putting it on themselves or it's coming from another source. Um, they get nervous seeing the other competitors, like their, their head is over here instead of right here. It's, it's, it's always the same things. It's just a different situation or a different scenario. And I, I feel like, I mean, that's kind of life, right? Like we're always almost learning the same lessons over and over again, but in different aspects of our lives or different stages of our life. Like it's going to look different, but if you really think about it, it's like, oh, I, I kind of walked through this before. Like I've been with it. It didn't look exactly like this, but I know what this is. Like I'm recognizing it. So it's really, I feel like kind of just being able to recognize, okay, what is this situation? What's really going on here? Um, I had a a pro athlete that was telling me she'd been on their national team for like over 10 plus years. She's got sponsors, but there was always this one person who always beats her. And she, for like, you know, 10 years, and she just would get really frustrated with that. But what was going on when we got down to it, she kept telling me she was really great at visualization. She was really good at all of these things. So I'm like, well, I wonder what it is. It's like, it's coming down to and, and she was even just firm in her belief that like, I'm good enough to beat this girl. So I'm like, well, what is coming down to it? So we started talking about what happens at the competition. What does she go through? What is she thinking? And all she's telling me is when she's getting ready to do her, her competition, she's thinking about all these other people competing. And I was like, how are you supposed to focus on what you're doing when you're worried about them? Of course, you're not going to win. You're thinking about those people. You're not thinking about this. You can't lend all your focus and, and be in the moment when you're thinking about these people over here. Mm-hmm. So it's so funny. Like you can know all the things, but you still fall into the traps. I mean, I did that even at the peak of my career, like at, at 2008 Olympic trials, I was doing the hardest dives I'd ever done in my career. And I was doing them amazing. I was doing a lot of things the men couldn't do at the time. I was the only woman in the world doing a certain like handful of dives. And I still got to the finals of the Olympic trials after having done a really good prelims and semis. And I completely botched a dive because I tried too hard instead of like 
focusing on the technique. I was just mm -hmm. trying to be great, you know, and I was, I put my focus on the wrong stuff and I completely ate it on my back in the middle of the Olympic trials mm -hmm. and was so furious, but I knew like, okay, well, I can't take that back. I can't go back and change that. It's done. I got to let it go. I can't be mm -hmm. mad going into the next dive. I've got to be able to focus on this. And the next dive, when I came back, I got straight tens on it. And I think it was only like the seventh time in like the Olympic trials history, somebody had ever gotten straight tens. Um, and so like, that was, that was a really cool thing, but like, it was something I had been through a million times and I still made the same mistake. It was just in a different mm -hmm. scenario. So it, you know, we're going to fail, like failure is just part of the process, but like recognizing what went wrong or what happened and learning from that and being able to be like, oh, I get what happened. Let me change that going into the next thing. Um, that's the only way you keep going up because like, it's never that straight line, right? It's like this, like loop de loop yeah, everywhere. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you just hope yeah, at the end of the trajectory or you're, you're still going upward. Oh, I love that. And so how do you, as a mom, you know, how do you allow your kids because you're an extremely driven person, you've gone to high highs. How do you allow them to to fail and and see them struggle and stuff and not you know interject right? Like you know that's my. It's like such a weird thing because my you know my personal life you know was crazy right and and like I think it just killed my parents to like see me like struggle for you know for twenty plus years. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I'm better for it, but, but, you know, how do you, as a parent, you know, who's reached the highest of the highs in, in sports and in life, you know, how do you, does that, does your training in the Olympics, like slide into your parenting sometimes? Uh, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, parenting is that kind of, you're learning on the job, right? Like there's a million parenting books out there, but it's only advice. It may or may not work. It may or may not help. You can implement what sounds good, but nobody mm -hmm. has it all figured out because your kids are different from their kids and mm -hmm. your personality is different from theirs. Um, you know, and I, I'm sure I was too, too there for them. Sometimes when they were little, like if they fell, picked them up right away instead of letting them learn. And as I had more kids, I figured that out, you know, and mm -hmm. I've apologized to my oldest a few times. Like, I'm so sorry. Like I learned on you. <laughs> so I really apologize. But she's my one who's gotten really competitive. Uh, she's in volleyball now. And the best thing I've, I've learned to do is just stay back. And sometimes I think I'm too hands off um, with mm -hmm. what she's doing. And I'll yeah. ask her a lot of questions. But that was the best gift I think my parents ever gave to me. They were there when I needed them. But they were mm -hmm. also just very like, you do your thing. As long as you are enjoying it and you're finishing like what you've committed to, that's fine. And they were very hands off. And, and it was what allowed me to flourish because I was allowed to fail. And I was allowed to do what I felt driven to do. And, you know, my mom would help me get up like at four o'clock in the morning to get to the workouts and stuff. But mm -hmm. as long as I was motivated, you know, if I, if it was like dragging me out of bed every day and I didn't want to do it, she wasn't going to help me. But because I was like, as soon as she woke me up, I was ready to go and I would do my thing. Like she was willing to be there. And so I feel like I've taken a lot of cues on that side from, from what they did for me. Um, Cause I, I got really lucky in the parent and the parent, yeah. mode. but, but yeah. also just talking to other parents, like, what they do it and seeing like, well, would that work for us? Would it not work for us? Or like, wow, I think that's probably not the way to handle that. I don't want to be like that. You know, yeah. and haven't seen parents the whole time in my career that were over obsessive that would film yeah. their kids at every practice yeah. and force them to watch it afterwards. Like that is just a recipe for disaster. I, I've so. done, I've done 700 and like plus podcasts. I've never watched myself once. So yeah, yeah. Can, I'm good. You know, <laughs> you know, leave it on the field, you know, and, yeah, exactly. uh, you know, we're, it's, I really enjoy meeting my entrepreneurship friends, kids, like the, the, the critical thinking, the, the, the out of the box thinking, which I live on and love is really instilled when a parent is, I'm, there's nothing wrong. You can be whatever you want, but I enjoy, you know, when I meet sports uh, kids, when I go over to my business partners, has, you know, the, the two girls, you know, he's, you know, he's still on TV for baseball and he, and he's like, He's like, so, you know, and they're like, God, dad, like the motivational speak tonight, you know, and he's always, you know, it's just so funny to me because he can't, he can't turn it, he can't turn it off, but they got, you know, words of affirmations everywhere and the kids are extremely driven and they're, and they're motivated and they're happy. And I just really enjoy that energy being around, you know, uh, asking your kids questions and letting them respond and think for themselves. Like it's a really cool environment that's created. Well, I think that's another thing I got from my dad too, because he, he's a CPA for like over 50 years, but he had his own business for mm -hmm. like a long time. And he just, he was one of those guys. I mean, he bought a plane and learned how to fly. He was the volunteer fire chief. He bought a sailboat, learned how to sail, made us compete with him. Yes. 
he, you know, now he owns an, at almost 80 years old, owns an 80 acre farm. And yeah, is like, your dad's my hero. Your dad is what I want to be. Yeah. So, and he's always told me like, if you don't know how to do something, just figure it out. Like if you want to figure it out, you'll find a way to figure it out. And like, I think just, and, and you can tell somebody that to be blue in the face, but when you watch somebody do that your whole life, like he learned to CPA and he learned how to write software and he sold software for a season. Like, I mean, he just, if it's not available and this is a good idea, I'll just make it like, I'll just do it on my own. And so yeah. I think seeing somebody put that into action has really helped encourage me to like, well, if I want to do something, all I have to do is figure out how, <laughs> like, so yeah. it, that sounds so silly because that's yeah. the big impossible part. Right. But again, with like goal setting and making these action plans, like you kind of start to create the how. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I just, I just love that. I just think there's anything is possible. You just have to figure out how. I love that. So if people want to find out about your coaching, your story, is there a place they can do that? Yeah. LauraWilkinson.com uh, slash learn. There's some free resources there. Um, you can pick up a, a couple of freebies, um, get on my email list. And there's a link to my podcast there as well. So I have pursuit of gold podcast where I talk to other elite athletes, coaches, experts, um, really trying to to help athletes uh, become their best, inspire them and give them resources and tools. But I mean, again, sports, like we've said, are such a good like analogy metaphor for life that mm -hmm. you're going to get a lot from it. Even if you're not an athlete, you just want a good story. Oh, that's so great. Guys, go check that out. And if you got any value, send it to a friend. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Mm -hmm.